Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to God be the glory. As always, great things he has done, he's doing, and he will do in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, a thousand apologies. We are one hour behind schedule. Please accept 
our sincere apology. You know, I always like to use this to back myself up. Man proposes, but God disposes. We tried, we strive, uh, but time and chance happened to them all. The one that happened to us today, it was not as we planned. But in all things, we're giving thanks to God. We're here. We overcame, we conquered, we pursued. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we are here. And I'm so grateful for the Lord for the opportunity that we have got again today to be able to come into your personal bubble, wherever that might be, on the road, at work, in the mall, in the park, even in your living room or even in your kitchen, wherever that is. We're saying thank you. God bless you. And to Cecilia, God bless you, ma. Good evening. My faithful auntie, God bless you, ma. So we are running way behind schedule. Like I said, we appreciate all of you, wherever it is that you are joining from, as always. I'm going to want to cut short all the normal things I would normally tell you if time permits. We'll talk about that at the end. Uh, so I want to hand over to Pastor Lide as we go into the next segment of confronting opposing isms. So again, please bear with us if you're just meeting us for the very first time. Uh, there are different aspects of the isms that Pastor Lydia is taking one at a time. Uh, so if you want to see the others, there's opportunity for you to see that. Today, we've put an end to materialism and we're moving into maybe secularism or racism or both. I don't know what the one hour will entail, but we're going to try. And let me just assure you again, if the Lord wills and he enables us, Pastor Lydia will be here on Friday to also continue. So what we don't finish today, we can uh, jump on to it on Friday uh, by the grace of God. And as always, you, you can always, always catch up on all the other uh, isms uh, or even the genesis of it, you can do that on our YouTube page that's Praying Child Community Channel. And if you just look for Pastor Lide Odushote, everything is ever done on this platform, you will find it there by the grace of God. So that's the lineup. And so I'm going to bring Pastor Lide on board. And here is Pastor Lide. And so we are hoping to do what to give it a blast we're going to blast off we've been trying to blast off for over one hour it didn't happen so finally we are going to blast off like the shuttle when the shuttle goes up into the sky hallelujah so <laughs> good to see everybody pastor Lide, welcome thank you thank you my dogged sister <laughs> Left for me, maybe we we'll, we'll postpone it to Friday, but Sister Funke said no. No, 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 we no, no. Do it. We will do it. We, we will were do 20 it. We were minutes before time, and we have been battling with the internet and the and the uh, browser. This time around, it was the browser. Oh, wow! But we had to blast through, and we so did. Here we are. <laughs> wow. Okay. We so overcame. She still insists that we have to do it. So. I'm, I'm, I'm at your service. So we are here. The expectation of the righteous shall not be cut off. We are expecting and we are going to be fed by the grace okay. of God. My so God's over God. to you, sir. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody in God's house. Those of us who are presently online and those of us who will be listening to it later. Mm. Thank you for joining us. Again, uh, this is a platform where people are being fed. I was listening to God's servant that spoke yesterday on uh, fatherhood of God or fathering or something. And for me, that was a brilliant uh, teaching. That was good. That's something. These are the things that we should be listening to. So again, we are getting into the business of God's word. Okay. So for a while now, we'll be looking at confronting opposing isms, philosophies, beliefs, uh, arguments, things that has become very, you know, they become strongholds in our minds and indirectly or unwittingly, unwittingly they shape how we live, they, they shape our worldview, they affect us, they program us, 
that even in our behaviors, in our conduct, we don't even know, we still think this is our choices, but it's not really your choices, it's because that's where we have been programmed to see life. So, and then we are trying to look at these isms, these belief systems, these philosophies, these teachings that, has, that have come to us directly or indirectly over the years, and then we are trying to demystify them with the word of God. The Bible says, casting down every imagination, every argument, every opposing beliefs, we cast them down, we challenge them with the word of God, we tame them, and we allow the word of God to now be what drives us. The Bible says, renew your mind. So we are learning this with the aid, with the mind of getting our minds renewed, getting ourselves transformed, so that as we find ourselves in this world, we are, even though we are adapting to whatever systems we find ourselves, we are not adopting the spirit of the age. We know that uh, there is a spirit that rules this present age, and that's the spirit that opposes all that is called Christ. But we are saying no, we are intentionally living, and our lifestyle and our living is informed by a new belief system that is informed in Christ. The Bible says you have not so learned Christ. So we are learning Christ to the end that we may bring up powerful behavior and lifestyle that is God glorifying. Okay. And so we trust God again that the Lord will be gracious to us as we run this evening. Okay, let's just have a word of prayers. And Father, we thank you again for the platform you have given to us again to learn of you, to receive your precious words. I ask that your spirit will help me to make your word known the way I ought to in the power, the supply of his wisdom, and you will help the heart of your people to receive the same to Amen. the end that we are in accurate alignment with all yours, that we Amen. may function and glorify you and be fruitful Amen. in those things that pass into your kingdom. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay, Amen. so we have been looking at confronting it, challenging, you know, taking head, head on, all those that oppose Christ and his thoughts. And the way we do that is as we take new form of truth inside us. So we have looked at narcissism, which is love of self. And we have, we have broken it down. And I think each and every one of us will need to listen to this message again. We have looked at narcissism. We look at materialism um, last uh, on Monday, I think some part last week. I just want to say one or two things about materialism. It's always good that we remind ourselves. In fact, one of the things I've said on this platform is that there is no new truth anywhere. Whatever we are hearing now is what was taught yesterday. As long as what we are teaching ourselves is the truth. And the way truth gets to us is repetition. We remind ourselves, we constantly, from all angles, we remind ourselves and we get stuck in the truth. Okay, maybe we should just start with Matthew and chapter 6. Matthew now and chapter 6. So we've looked at materialism as to matter being everything, money and all it can bring, being everything to man in terms of what define our worth, what define meaning for us in life and the goal of our existence. And what we are saying is that while matter is given for us to enjoy, we joyfully, we thankfully and joyful, thankfully receive these things and we joyfully enjoy them but we never make them the end of our existence. Man eats food, but man is not created to eat food. Man wear clothes, but we are not created to wear clothes. Man ride car, we, use, we need vehicle to take us from one point to another in a comfortable way, but that is not what we exist for. And so we were not created for matter, or we are not created for money and all it can bring. We are created to have fellowship, relationship, with the creator, to have that kind of bond, God-man relationship, dependent relationship, fellowship with him, and then we are receiving of his nature, we are sharing of his life, partaking of his life constantly in fellowship so that we may govern his creation to the end that he has in mind, and he takes all the credit at the end of the day. These are the things we have discussed. And we say that after the fall, error came in, the distortion entered into man, so the means has become the end of his existence. And we are saying we must confront this as saints of God, even though this is obtainable in the world, we're saying for you and I, it's going to be no. We're not going to be, you know, 
naive in the issues of life. We are not just happy. We don't have a happy-go-lucky attitude. We are circumspect. We are decisive. And we know the reason for which we are here. We are saying the reason of us is to glorify God. God is the reason. And God has revealed himself, revealed himself in his Christ. So Christ is the reason. Instead of matter, it must be God all the way for us. So that's what we have said, the summary of what we have said so far. We have said that narcissism, which is love of self, take advantage, you know, that root, you know, now says that you must worship himself, worship yourself with matter. So everybody define themselves and have sense of what in whatever they have and whatever, whatever position and we are demystify all those things. Now let's move ahead in materialism, just say one or two things and then we quickly run to uh, secularism. Okay, so Matthew now and chapter six, uh, verse, um, verse uh, let's see where I start, from, from, from verse 19 now, from verse, okay, let's go from verse 20. But lay up your treasures in heaven, where moth nor rust does not corrupt and where thieves does not break through and steal. So as we labor and as we come in contact with money and all it can bring, Jesus is giving us wisdom here that for us, we must not lay up our treasure on earth. While we have houses, cars, and everything, good things of life, we must see to it that these are not our treasure. In fact, the true treasure of a believer must be what you convert and you lay up in heaven to come. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. And we have looked at this in many ways as to our generous way of using this thing, God's word, giving, helping others, giving to God's work, using all God has endowed with us to build up ourselves so that we can be useful and that we can worship God and serve God, using our worst thoughts to raise our godly family, be a blessing to others, easy way to convert in this. So we are not here to lay up treasure here. So we don't use all our money for clothes, moth, and for food, rust. And then where thieves break through, and we have said this truth, this thieves here is from the Greek word, um, um, kleptis, kleptis, and it means a pilfer, somebody who deceives other with cunning craftiness, with false, false teachings, and he takes money from them. And here he's not talking about Satan, he's talking about fellow human being who comes into our space, it can be a pastor, it can be a teacher, it can be anybody, but they use cunning way to steal our money by teaching us, by instructing us in things that are not God's word. And, then it, and that's what the Bible is referring to here as thieves. But he said, lay up your treasure in heaven. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart also will be. Now let's go to verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 24 now, and I will close there. Then we'll go to uh, secularism. No man can serve two masters. For he that will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold on to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Okay, so in that line of thought, he now came and he told us that we can't serve two masters. You can only serve one. So each and every one of us, you are only serving one person, either God or mammon, either God or mammon. And the way we serve God is to, you know, diligently, honestly, wisely, creatively, and, you know, deploy and use all us, our intelligence, our mental capacity, everything God has endowed us with and everything we are learning in a legitimate way, you know, enter into the job, into the marketplace, into creation, labor, bring goods and, or services to the market. You know, you're exchanging that, you're bringing values, you're solving problems, and that comes to you in monetary terms. Monetary terms, that's an exchange going on. Now, we're now saying that when that comes, you now use that as a servant of God. So even at the point of labor, you know you are you are laboring as a servant of God in the marketplace. And when the money comes, you are also using it. But beyond just meeting your our needs, we are using the money to lay up treasure for ourselves on the other side. Else, anything contrary to this will mean you are serving money. And that is materialism. So materialism also reveals itself 
in laying up treasure for one year. So everything is about what is traceable, what those things that are traceable to us. If it is not traceable to us, then it must not stand. But for us as saints of God, many things will not be traceable to us before, because before we can even accumulate anything, we have already, you know, the Bible says he has dispersed, he has given, he has given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. So we are, uh, you know, we are dispersing, we're giving, we're sowing into the life of people. And we know, according to the wisdom of God, our treasure is on the other side. We are not giving so that we can say we are sowing seed, then we can get something tomorrow. We go beyond that. We know the ultimate for us is on the other side. Else, you are still materialistic when you are giving and the wisdom behind that giving is still the father more will come to you in a material way tomorrow and that will be traceable to you and you can now begin to show about how much you have what we are saying are saying is that we give in that absolute trust and confidence and you know and reliance in the wisdom of god knowing that await you know awaiting us you know on the other side are treasures that we have laid up for ourselves through our obedience initiated by the love of God on the inside of us. So through that, we destroy materialism through laying up treasure for ourselves on the other side. So when I come to Sister Funke now, it should be obvious to anybody that whatsoever you see with her, in terms of the cash she has, the houses she has, the truth is this, Sister Funke is richer than those things because many things you can see with her, she has already sent them ahead of her. She has given, she has distributed. She, should, she too could have amassed those things to herself, but because of the scripture, the truth, the wisdom of God, she has laid up for herself treasure in time to come. That is what Christianity is about in terms of how we destroy and confront materialism. We have said so much about it. I just said I should add that for us. That will also help us as we confront materialism. Now let's go to secularism today secularism now secularism simply says there is a definite division or a divide a line of division between things secular and things spiritual things religion or things really uh, things religion they are definite separate you know that what religion spiritual everything must be relegated to religious circle and when we take things secular in terms of marketplace education and other stuff that has to do with our common place pleasure sports those things are secular and you must not bring religion or anything that has to do with spirituality to that angle so both of them are completely separate. In fact, we take that to now talk about separation between state and religious institution. And I'll come to that. So secularism is an ism that says both of them do not overlap and there is no junction where they meet. So a secularist believes the consciousness of God and deference to God must not be brought to the marketplace. Let it be, you understand, limited to religious environment and let it be, you know, limited to spirit when you are discussing spiritual stuff. Now, that looks simplistic. It looks innocuous or harmless, but I think this is serious problem to man. If, and I think this is a major reason while our societies, our culture is sliding into all manner. When you look at a lot of problem in our society today, devices, you know, breakdown on value system, morality, you know, we don't really, we don't really exalt our, our, our uphold virtues anymore. Then you find that it's many of those things that we have said over the time and we are not harvesting the fruit. Recently, Canada said that there will be strict laws on gun, you know, use of guns, and then no more holding of gun, you having license to gun and things like that, just because of what has been happening in the US. And I always felt that, I've always believed this, that a time is come with all this, our 
extreme libertinism, you know, we're just liberal, we're going to destroy ourselves. Because man, without boundaries, without really operating under holistic truth, we might think that we are being, we are exercising our freedom, but freedom that doesn't have restraint, that doesn't have moral boundaries, ultimately is bondage. The truth is man is not ultimately free. We are in bondage to one thing or the other. We are servant to something. Is that you are servant to the true God or you are servant even to yourself or to your appetite? Now, being a servant to oneself or to one's appetite, we ultimately is destructive. Not only will you destroy yourself, but you will have destroyed many on your path. That's why truth must be absolute. And that's one of the last things I'll be talking about today, relativism. So secularism says teachings about morality, sorry, about religion and spirituality, everything must be relegated to religious circle and don't bring that to secular environment. But what we are saying and we read in the scripture is that it's no for us as saints. So the saints of God, the Christians, must be sensitive to what secularism is. Not just that, but even as Christians, sometimes we inadvertently preach or practice secularism because we don't consciously allow the Christian life to shape us in the marketplace, which is a form of secularism. So we see Christian who goes to church, Christians who go to church, they, they go to church, they learn this, but it doesn't reflect. We are not consciously bringing to bear the teachings of Christ, the life of Christ to shape us. And for me, that's a form of secularism. Even though you claim you don't believe it, but your lifestyle doesn't showcase that. So what we are saying is that for us, this is not it is not complete truth. For the Bible tells us all your involvement must be done with this, doing all things to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 30 says, Whatsoever then you do, brethren, in words or in deeds, whatever, anything, do all to the glory of God. Allow your allegiance, your vertical relationship cultivated in your fellowship with God to dictate and rule your heart in all your marketplace involvement. You see something, the reformers who are, you know, so they were so critical to uh, the birth of um, civilization, civilizations uh, as far as Europe and Western world is concerned, they knew this. And so they taught the old saints of those days that their workplace life must be shaped by their life in Christ must be shaped, must be dictated, and they must see that all their work environment is as spiritual as going to church. Not in the sense that they are spiritualizing the environment, but they should know this, that nothing in self is secular. Everything must be done as servants of Christ. That is what these people taught. So there was no boundaries as far as they are concerned. And that means a Christian can readily allow his position in Christ, the new realities that is found in Christ, righteousness, holiness, sanctification, being justified, you know, in terms of his personal allegiance to God should regulate how he operates in the market. For instance, I can steal the consciousness, the consciousness of the fact that I am a child of God, I'm a Christian, necessitate and regulate my heart in the marketplace, in the way I walk. So you see, Christian life destroy the philosophy of secularism because in my practice and obedience, to Christ, I just found that there is no zone or in, in, in all my involvement or our involvement where Christ is not the Lord. So for us, the marketplace is not different from when I'm going to church. It's the same, but when I go to a fellowship with other saints, I don't take that 
in quote as a spiritual thing then when i'm going to my work is a kind of thing is a careless place and i can do anyhow no to us the same spirit that rules our involvement our heart as we go to church in fellowship is the same spirit that rules our heart as we interact in the marketplace let me show you something so many scriptures we can show ourselves, but I don't want to spend so much time. Once we get the foundation, we get the understanding that we can move to the next. Okay. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. Look at what he says. He said, Masters. Here he's talking to about Christians, masters, you know, Christian employers. Give to your servant that which is just and equal. In other words, pay your work as well. Be fair in your payment, in your emolument, in your salary payment, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. That's a spiritual relationship because that's not obvious to nobody. That's your spiritual connect with your master in heaven. So he's saying your relationship with your master in heaven should regulate how you deal with your workers in the, in the marketplace. So with this, this destroys secularism. So for us as Christians, there is nothing like secularism. All zones of our involvement must be done as servants of God. I must not see preaching like this, a spiritual operation, something that I'm doing for God, then I see cooking for my husband as a kind of thing. No, the Bible doesn't have that picture. The Bible says that the same spirit by which I prepare for this sermon, and I want to do it with all fear and trembling as a servant of Christ, and I want people to really learn and come to God, the same way when I come to secular environment, if I'm cooking, for example, I want to cook good food. I want to make sure that I serve it where people enjoy the food and they can thank God on my behalf. If you are a driver, I want to drive smoothly. I want to take my the passenger from one point to another and let them enjoy the journey, at least with the, the best of my ability. This is how to do it as servant of God. If you're a teacher, I want to teach well. I want to pour my heart in teaching and see to it that the student get this thing and they don't just pass exams. They know this thing. They take ownership of their well-formed. So this is what we are saying. And we're saying that, you know, for us as Christians, our, our, our relationship with God informs our own operation in the marketplace. So secularism doesn't hold way with us. It can hold for anybody, but for us, it's no. We do not put Christ in the church. Even though we don't go to the public space and you know be disturbing everybody and colonizing the atmosphere with Christian uh, words or Christianizing the atmosphere, but we are saying for us, our own allegiance to Christ rules our heart, the way we do our things. So when somebody begin to dig and they want to dig into us, at the end of the day, they will wonder why do you do? Why are you behaving the way you are behaving? And then they're going to meet Christ behind the scene of our heart okay i don't know whether i gave this and I, I think at this junction is a good example that one can give and uh, it was this um air hostess that um it was um howard hendrix is a theologian he was on a journey one time like that and then there was a uh, a kind of fuse between some of the uh air hostesses and then uh this passenger and um, it was really a row so this lady came into the scene. So our Hendrick said he observed the grace by which this lady entered into the conversation and quell everything with a sweet word. In fact, it was so gracious that all the, you know, the passengers were just wondering, who is this lady? So when he sat, eventually got across to the lady and, and you know, beckoned to her and said, Madam, who are you? Blah, this. I, and said, can, you, can I have your name? I want to write a strong recommendation about you to this airline. And the lady said, it don't be necessary. He said, why? He said, because I don't work for this airline. I work for Christ. So our Hendrick said, he nearly fell off his seat. That he has never had anybody spoke that way. Now, the truth is, is the lady is so conscious that her gracefulness, the way she can, can carry herself in the marketplace is informed by 
her own personal allegiance to Christ. And that informed how she worked. You see, in our today's world, we have taken secularism to, you know, to extent you can just imagine. That even the Western world, we are, we are already removing the Asian landmarks. We are removing the world. You know, somebody said, don't, don't pull down that wall until you find out why it, why it was built. We're pulling out everything. We told our children no more anything about Christ or Bible in the school. You know, we're removing everything, Bible in the marketplace. Yet, the foundation of many of our countries, Canada inclusive, US inclusive, even UK, a lot of many of our institutions were built on Judeo-Christian uh, truth. And we are removing everything today. Only God knows in the next 20, 30 years, the damage we are doing to ourselves today. You see, we think we are clever. We think we have arrived. But we have forgotten how we got here. The values, the, the, the life, the allegiance that shaped our fathers, we are putting everything. Those guys said, in God we trust on our currency. At least as far as U.S. is concerned. We are now saying, no, there's nothing like that. All this Jesus thing, all this, you know, we, we are so we are so full of ourselves. But you see, the God, our Lord is gracious. I know there are still many, even in the same system, who are saying no to this, who are saying God will just have mercy on us. And I think God is having mercy. Lastly, on secularism, let me just bring this, and then we go to the racism. So all these ones that we are saying, no more uh, uh, Bible in our schools, no more mentioning Jesus, no more mentioning anything. At the end of the day, you see, it's not just about religion, it's just about Jesus that we don't want in our schools. Because ultimately, reality and truth is still around Jesus. You see, people can even call any other religion. There is no offense. But when you go to Jesus in the marketplace, everybody is just on edge about they've come again. But the truth is, it's not that we have come again. We have always been here. Even the air you are breathing is saying Jesus that is sustaining you. It's just that Jesus is gracious. You understand? Okay, so these are all the truth that you should we should know. So all this, no more Bible in our schools, no more Bible in the public place, no more Jesus, everything. Well, we can say all that, but I think ultimately it's not for our common good. But for those of us who know this truth, even though they tell you don't bring Bible, thank God for smartphones, th thank God for everything that God is allowing technology to bring, that our children can still, in a way, still be filled with the knowledge of the truth. Because for us, there is no zone where Christ does not, has not declared himself the Lord over our lives. And I want to say this as I close. The truth is this. We cannot legislate morality. We cannot legislate the conversion of heart of anybody until a man lives in allegiance to a transcendent God. And that shapes all his operation. Our society will conk. We'll just find that we are doing a work to ourselves. Many of these, our children that are misbehaving, can we imagine that we have taught them, given them the knowledge of God, the fear of God, good conscience towards God, beyond even what the society is now using strict rules to tame us. We'll find that a lot of these things will not be needed. So for us, there is nothing like secularism. It is Christ all the way. Let's close with Ephesians chapter six on that and we go to relativism Ephesians six and verse uh, let's go from verse um, uh, verse five it says servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as you know of your heart as unto Christ see it employers respect your employee sorry employee respect your employer your boss you know your masters in the workplace, with true fear, with genuine respect and regard. He said, as unto Christ. You can see it. So Christ is not relegated. This is not just something morality. It is a pure heart of worship in the marketplace, shaping the heart of the saints. Not with eye service. So we are not really doing our own as men pleasers. But as servant of Christ, you see it again, we are servant of Christ in the marketplace. So a Christian is not only serving God when he's doing, in quote, what we call spiritual work. For instance, I'm preaching now, I am doing God's work. Somebody is praying, he's doing God's work. Somebody is sleeping in four corners of the church, he's doing God's work. Then when you are cooking for your husband, you are doing whose work? 
You are doing yourself work. There's nothing like that. When you are cooking for your husband, you are doing God's work. When you are sweeping, you are doing God's work. When you are driving that Uber and you are taking somebody, or you are a pilot behind the plate or cockpit, you are, you are a teacher, you are a lecturer, you are on IT, whatever you are doing, as far as God is concerned, the Bible is concerned, you are a servant of Christ in that space. As long as you are doing it with a heart in allegiance to the master, allowing is your relationship with him to shape how you work, the diligence, the excellence, you know, how far you go without bringing your best into this. In fact, the reason why I bring my best, it's not just for the money. It's because I am a servant of Christ and there is no way, there is no other way we can do it. Even if you don't pay me, I can do less. Joseph was not paid in Potiphar's house. And he was a servant. He gave his best. And Potiphar cast notice on him to the extent that he made him, you know, the, the leader of all the servants. So what we are saying is that this is how we walk, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as servant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, with good spirit, with good attitude, as to the Lord, not unto men. So a Christian must, all of us must know this. Whether you're a medical doctor and you're earning, let's say you're earning $10,000 per month, or you're earning 15, or you're earning back in Nigeria, you're earning, let's say, $400 per month, whatever you're earning, none of you as Christians should at any point think you're working for money. Man will pay us, but you are working for a person. Your true employer is Christ. That's what the Bible is telling us. Your, the true person you are serving is not Canadian government. It's not Nigerian government. It's not Asian, you know, it's not uh, Japanese government. Those are just your uh, employer on earthly uh, level. But your true employer is Christ. The same way your personal business, it, the truth is I'm the owner of this business, but the truth is this, you are in allegiance to a transcendent master. And he must shape how you do all yours in the marketplace. The same thing, parenting. You are the father of your children, but ultimately, you yourself, you have a father in heaven. And that must regulate your heart. So when we know this, our involvement in everything we have to do with, we take a different toll. In fact, in that case, mediocrities, all manner of indolence, carelessness, wastage, you know, everything we, we seize. And then laziness we see. Can you imagine because there's free money, if I'm not working, my, my state will give me stipend every month and then you don't want to work again. For us, it's a no as a Christian. We will still work. In fact, the mere fact that that is there doesn't mean we take advantage. As, as soon as whatever problem, challenges we have is over, we go back to work. Because our own is, we must contribute to God's word. We must be part of those who are deploying their skills, their abilities, their knowledge, their standard, their skill, their competence, everything into God's word and making it better so that man, mankind will enjoy through our collective works that we are doing to the glory of God. Okay, so these are the things I want to say about secularism, knowing and whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same he shall receive the reward of the Lord. So ultimately, God is going to re reward all of us on the basis of how well we have served in the what in the secular space, which must be done as a servant of Christ. So everything we do must be done from this attitude of heart. I am serving Christ. Okay. The next one we want to look at is racism. Racism. Should I go to racism now? Okay. Just looking at it. Okay, let me secularize. Let me just quickly go to relativism. Then we'll come to racism. Okay. Relativism. Well, uh, relativism is belief system again that has crept into us gradually. Maybe because we are full. You know, when man becomes full, any theory is that whole, you just start thinking, you know, no holds bar. We become careless and what relativism actually says is that there is no absolute truth truth is relative standards are relative knowledge is relative depending on whatever a group of people consider as truth it becomes the truth for them if you consider something as no truth then 
is not the truth. So, and I think that that is a dangerous one. So it says ethical truths depend on individual and groups holding them. In other words, what is true in Canada might not be the truth in the US. What is true in the US or in certain states in the US or in one state might not be the truth in another. While I know there are certain belief system or there are certain things that shape all of us in our uh, collectives, there are some minor that shape us. So there are some things we agree on. But there are some truths that are not negotiable. They cut across time, space, color, geographical location, whatever they cut across. They are, for instance, when you say two plus two, I don't think two plus two has to do with any space, any place, or vary from place to place. Two plus two is four, anywhere and everywhere. But when you now begin to say relativism must be taken to all its limit, then two plus two cannot be four everywhere. Because that's what we're actually saying by relativism. And I think relativism ultimately will destroy all of us because it's going to come with some implications if we really know what we are saying. Now, I think, as I think about relativism, I think personally man is rebellious. Man, naturally, in our fallen state, all of us. And even in the best of our societies, what has helped us to have good society is strict rule of laws, rule of law, strict one, strict measures, good policing that, are, that is there, keeping all of us in check. Otherwise, the whole society will break down. Can you imagine somebody says, I want to drive my car along against traffic? Because that's what he believes. That is what is more convenient for me. And I think it's faster for me. So why can't I drive that when the, everything is relative? So when you say truth is relative, then there will be no standards. There will be no ideals. And that is what, that's the ground we are setting for ourselves. And for me, and from the Bible, you will see that that is dangerous for our collective. In fact, no society and the whole globe cannot coexist without absolute. Do you know that even in natural laws, they are absolute? Gravity is gravity anywhere across the earth. Why don't we change? Why don't we bend it for ourselves that gravitational force in Nigeria will not be gravitational force in another place? If gravity maintained the same, if frictional laws, you know, frictional force, uh, 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 momentum, and all the waves and all the electromagnetic laws that guides all, all the wave theories that we are discovering today, if all of them are absolute, and it's on the absolute that we're able to have our science and it can have our technology, why then do we come to certain truth that helps our togetherness in terms of moral boundaries? And we begin to say that there is no absolute truth. Obviously, something you know, there is an enemy somewhere planting some strange truth into our minds. And it's, be, it's going, you know, like a wildfire now all over the globe. And for me, it's destructive. And that's why we are having all manner of things. Somebody can just wake up and he says, there's no absolute, abs there is nothing like absolute sex. That there's nothing like male or female. Male or female is relative. I can be a male tomorrow. I can be a female tomorrow. For me, it stems from relativism. When there is no absolute, the Bible says male and female, he created them, created he them. Even in the animal world, you will see a lion and a lioness. You will see male lion, female, male goat, female. But when it comes to a man, truth is relative. So we now begin to have sexes of different shades. Is that the way we should live? I think. It's not just about the sex. It's because originally we first lower the standard by saying that there is no absolute. And so we're going to take this into different aspects of our lives. And for me, if that is what we believe, then somebody can wake up tomorrow and say, I feel like killing somebody. I think you're going to kill. Why must we jail the person? Once we have said that there is no absolute truth, 
If somebody says, I want to buy something and I don't feel like paying, I don't feel like paying, then it should be right because it doesn't feel like paying. Why must it pay? When, when truth is now relative for all of us, when my truth is the truth, then there will be no standard. So, but the Bible did not hold that for us. Truth, falsity, right or wrong, standard of procedures of things and justification must be absolute. There must be definite thing called good and there must be definite thing called evil. But where we cannot differentiate between good and evil, and we say that we don't even know what good is or evil is tomorrow, then society is going to self-destruct. And we are seeing all manner today. We are seeing many things strange. You know the last time one guy took gun and killed of about 19 kids. When the president of the US, Joe Biden, came, he said this is one of the things he feared most as to doing, coming to address the whole nation as to another gun, you know, another person uh, uh, killing spree. Somebody take gun and they begin to kill. He said this is another thing he doesn't want to do. And I watched him. And you know what he said? He said, and, he, and I look at him as he look unto to God. And almost like praying, God have mercy on us. I saw, I saw that man coming to his, his end. You see, the truth is this, when we come to our end, we will know that we are breaking boundaries. Until we all come down to this, truth is not relative, definite truth. And we must teach our children everywhere, in the school, everywhere. Not just we are teaching them those things that has to do with mental capacity alone. We must teach them those things that has to do with heart convictions, respect for life, honesty, character, boundaries, that and then holding each and every one of us accountable to the truth and judging us on the basis of the truth. But where we say there is, there is no absolute truth, you know, I was asking somebody one day, I said, if we say there is no absolute truth, then how does law court exist? On what basis do we judge people when they commit crime? What, what standard do we use? If it's absolutely, somebody claim, I said, well, I am a relativist. I don't believe in absolute truth. I don't believe that what, what doesn't belong to me, you know, is absolute. Nothing belongs to anybody. That's the belief I work with. So why must you catch me? So I think we should be able to give that person that benefit of that and let him go because it's the beliefs. Otherwise, we must crap all this belief system that is growing like wildfire. In fact, today, it seems as if some of these isms are really in no cause, but the truth is this. Our children will take it far. Our children will take it far. Our children are not reading today. and We are, we are there. Our children are not going. They can't endure hardship. They can't endure things. We can't correct them. You can't spank them. You leave them alone. We just want to pamper them. Anything they want, we give them. You see, the, 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 the strenuous thing, the diligence, the discipline, the fathers embrace to build their cities. They are destroying it day by day. And we, are, we still think we can continue in this. For us, it is not true. I read, you know, I went through some of these things and I was, as I read, I got this again. It said, all opinions, beliefs, religion, uh, religion, moralities are equally good. All, whatever you call it is good. Anything you call it good. So, and that is moral relativism. All beliefs, truth, you know, all beliefs, truth, worldview, every theory, everything, anything that comes to you is true. It can be. Everything cannot be true. We can't have epistemic relativism. It's not going to work. We're going to destroy ourselves ultimately. And so what the Bible is saying that while you have your freedom, man, let your freedom be guided with truth. And truth is absolute. All of us must submit to the absolute truth. And as I think of it, the reason why a lot don't believe in absolute truth is because once you believe in absolute truth, it will lead us to an absolute God. There is the definite God. And once you believe in a God, it will lead you to Christ. And this is the problem of man. We don't want to submit to a definite God because we have said that there is no God. And if there is no God, there cannot be no absolute truth. But that's wrong. On what then do we organize our society? All our traffic lights, all our road system, how do we judge it? 
Why can we have order? Then there should be disorderliness all over the place. But that is, and but when you come to all this area, we put strict laws, we put strict rules, rules in our judicial system, in our banking sector, in our in many of the things. But when it comes to our behaviors, we say truth is relative. We say somebody can decide to be this today and tomorrow. Why don't you this? If you can change your sex, why don't you just decide that tomorrow you're a rich man and then the, the nation should just pour money on your laps? Why don't you just decide that? I think we should just take this thing. In fact, for me, we have done little with that, what we think we know. We should go, we should be, we should, we should be more wild than the way we are. We should just tell Big Gate, the, all your money cannot just be your money, distribute it. Because that's what we believe. Nobody must have anything as his own. I think we should just push the limit and see that we just destroy everything. But the truth is this, whether we like it or not, even the society we see celebrate today, it is truth that is still shaping it. You might not acknowledge it, but it is truth. So for us as Christians, when we know this, then let's celebrate the truth. Let's go for the truth. And that's where I close on relativism, saying there is absolute truth as far as we are concerned. I believe in the fact that there is nothing like relativism. Truth is truth. And that is why we must look for it. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. So by the time you start searching for the truth, at the end of the day, at the end of all your search, you're going to meet Jesus there, waiting for you all along. I've always been the truth. It's just that you never acknowledge me. Second Corinthians chapter 3, chapter 13, verse 8. Second Corinthians 13, and verse 8. It says, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. There's nothing you can do against the truth. You see, truth doesn't bend for anybody. Even if you say you don't agree with the truth, truth is relative, he won't fight you. The only thing is that truth will tell you, you have done injury to yourself, you will reap the harvest. Truth doesn't fight nobody. Truth is loving. But the only challenge is that you will destroy yourself if you don't acknowledge the truth. So, Submitting to the truth is the only wise way to live our lives, to live well, the only way. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So it's better we treat our children the truth. I was talking to my son uh, one day like that. He had a row with some of his friends that, you know, he was for a while he was living with some of his friends, and then they, they misuse his things, like that. some of the uh, tools he was using for his business. They misused it. He, he, he spoke to them and then he repaired it. He bought another one and he was having those challenges until it was pushed to the wall. And then he just, you know, he fled up and he spoke to them. And he told me all that went. And I said, I agree with you. I said, but the truth is this. While I agree with you, the way you behaved is unchristian for me. Christianity doesn't permit you to go to that extent. You didn't show love. Yet, yes, you don't like what they did, but is that the way truth will behave? Truth says this is the way we behave as Christians. So when we finish, he said, I'll go and apologize. I said, that's the way truth works. What we are saying is that there is what is called objective truth that is beyond just, you know, what we see. Two times two is four. There is objective truth that must shape our heart. And we must not take our freedom to destroy truth. You see, our children must grow up to know what is called respect, to know what is called honor, to know what is called, you know, to honesty, integrity, diligence, hard work. They must know all these things. For us to, to know what is called definite sex, there's nothing like sex is relative. They must know that is definite. To say all this on the long run, Yes, you are free to do whatever you are, you can do, but it won't pay us. We just want emotionally, we will we'll be torn apart. We'll be deceiving ourselves, ourselves with things that will not ultimately satisfy us. Somebody said, I believe in freedom to tattoo my body, and it takes tattoo to its limit. It takes, you know, body implant to the limit. Why not do it? But you see, the truth is this, all things must be done with moderation. That's the truth. Somebody says it's my money and I can buy any clothes I want. 
Truth says yes, but truth says do all yours with what? With moderation, with temperance, with self-control. So at the end of the day, whatever freedom we have, truth says, are you sure this is all the truth that regulates you or there's still more truth you are ignoring? Any one of us that will not absolutely, you know, you know, will not uphold absolute truth, at the end of the day, we ultimately you will go behind the bar. You just find yourself behind the bar. You don't believe in absolute truth. So why must we say somebody is raping? Why should we say somebody is sleeping with a minor? Because he he's a relativist. He says he's relative, anybody. But you see, that belief system sometimes it seeps into people and they don't know when they will cross the boundary and to begin to be, you know, to practice what they should not practice. See how many celebs are behind the bar today, languishing in prison because of no moral restraint. We go, we blow the, you know, we, 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 we blow it. We take our freedom to whatever extent. You, 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 you take advantage of the minor. You're a pedophile. You do all manner of things. And the truth is this. If you dig into many of us, we are playing with fire. We are not holding truth. We are not accountable to the truth. Let me say that no matter who you are, no matter how rich, no matter your position, no matter your possession, you must hold yourself, you understand, accountable to the truth. Let the truth regulate you. Even when no man can see you, don't break the truth, regardless of the freedom. And don't allow, you understand, all this newfound freedom, all these new age realities to shape your heart. It will, self, it will destroy us on the long run. So I don't think I'll get into relativism today. I'll just, uh, to racism, I'll just close on this. Let me just read two scriptures and I think I'm done with this. Okay, look at it again. Uh, Romans and chapter one. So for us who are Christians, there's nothing like relativism. You know, the Bible tells us in the days of judges, the judges, the Bible said, and there was a time when there were no kings in Israel and everybody did what was right in their eyes. And it was chaos, no progress. Everybody did what was right because that's relativism. So relativism has always existed. And that is why God put structure. God put authority to push structure to help us. Authority of parents, authority of government in a church, authority of pastor, you understand, in a, in, at home, authority of a husband. God put it there. This is the only way man can walk. Otherwise, man will self-destruct. Can you imagine somebody whose father walked out on, from that family at the age of two or three or four? You can't compare that kind of a person that will be produced out that kind of no, you know, no, you know, fatherly impute on somebody whose parents were really there to parent them well. Look at many of our boys on the street, many, you know, into drugs and everything. A lot of them is traceable to parenting. And parenting in terms that no absolute truth was, was instilled or was instilled in them. And this is what happened. And you are saying that there's, everything is relative. You will destroy our young one. We will destroy them. We will destroy the society. So there was a time in, in Israel. Everybody was doing what was right in them. If you read Judges 17, 6, and then Judges 21, 25, everybody just do whatever they like. It can't, it can't work. It will lead to, it will lead to decadence. It will, it will lead to chaos. It will lead to all manner, you know, I can't imagine it, the kind of society we're going to have ultimately. So let's read Romans chapter one and verse, Romans chapter one, verse 16, I guess. There is a, um, um, look at it now. God gave them to a, to a vile aff affection. There's a scripture there talking about vile affection. Who hold the truth of God in a lie? There's a scripture like that. Uh, let me see. Yes, that's it. Verse 25. Verse 25. It says, who changed the truth of God into a lie? The word who changed, who suppress, who suppress it, 
who come, who came up with their own truth. Because whether we like it or not, something is regulating you. Whatever belief system you have, something is regulating you. And if it is not absolute truth, then it's a false truth. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creator and down the creator who is blessed forever. For this cause, God gave them to vile affections. See, see, when you and I were decent, we maintain decorum and all those things, it's because there is a restraint from God. There is a God in heaven behind the scene who is helping our heart. And when we say no to him, we don't want him, he will let go. And by the time he let go, it, you, you can't imagine what they can do. You can't imagine what I can do in terms of vices if God should let go of me. If I just say, tell God, let go of me, leave me. Let me do what I want to do. But just that God is gracious. He doesn't want us to self-destruct. But I only hope we will not overpower him by telling him we, have, we are going to wrestle you to, to your knees. Leave us alone. You know, but God is gracious. So he said, for this cause, God gave them to a vile affection. For even their women did change natural use into that which is against nature. This is relativism. You're going against the norm. And it's happening in our society, in our world today. And likewise, men living the natural use of women, born in their laws, one towards another, men with men, working with that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves recompense of, the, to, of their own error, which was meat, which was fit. At the end of the day, we won't enjoy it. And it's not only in this. It can even happen in the church when the truth of Christ is not taught, we are coming with new truth. And for me, it's relative. We're going to relativism. Christianity is an absolute preaching. There is a truth. We are preaching Christ and everything has to do with him. But by the time 10 pastors are preaching 10 different things, we are going to self-destruct. And everybody saying, this is my truth. So what you are saying, that truth is relative, even to in the Bible. There's nothing like that. All pastors are called. We are all called to preach the same thing about Christ and his works, about his Christ, his work in creation, and his work in redemption. And how we, we in, you know, we are being redeemed in him to steward his creation, enjoy it together, and glorify God in all our involvement. I think if we know this and we walk in this truth, happy shall we be, and happy will be our children. The Lord will help us. I close. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. I am the truth, absolute, not I am a truth. So there is a definite, absolute truth. And by the time we crystallize everything, truth crystallizes in a person. And the person is Christ, the truth, both for creation and for the church. May the Lord give us understanding. Amen. And may the Lord help us that we will Amen. celebrate the truth. And it will be truth that guides our hearts all Amen. the way in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Lide. You were just a little bit over, but we made the one hour. So we give God all the praise. Uh, again, everybody, a thousand apologies for the lateness for today. You know, we not been this late in a very, very long time. So if you were not here at the beginning, obviously, you didn't know what happened. We had a lot of technical issues that took a long time to resolve. By God's grace, all things being equal, uh, we will endeavor to start on time again on Friday, by the grace of God. That's our proposal. What God allows is another thing entirely. So uh, please, as always, uh, with again, one of my favorite scriptures, Paul says, brethren, pray for us. Pray for us. Look, we are living in such challenging times, such challenging times. Relativism, racism, name it. The whole shebang, sexism, it's all out there. But as children of God, I like what Pastor Lide said in conclusion. As a child of God, for me, for you, for our sons and daughters, the gospel, the truth, the good news of Jesus Christ is not relative. It's only one truth. Regardless of who is talking about it, it should be one truth. There's only one truth 
gospel is the news is the good news about jesus christ there's only mm -hmm. one christ jesus mm -hmm. so there's no element of relativism there isn't but i pray that we will help our sons and daughters to come to this truth because many of these things that pastor lady is talking about we as parents i'm not trying to uh, be condescending or put anybody down is the truth of the reality of life that we live. Many of these things that Pastor Lady is actually saying is more applicable to our children. They're the very one in the stream of this thing right now, of all these isms that is going on. So really, I see it as resources that Pastor Lady is bringing to the table for us to open our eyes of understanding when we have an understanding of what it is that he's bringing to the table, we can help our sons and our daughters to come to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The, the, the issue of sexism, you know, I'm glad he mentioned it. I don't know whether you've heard some of these, Pastor Lady. Yes. A few months ago, in you know, we have a health service called the National uh it's called the nhs health service mm. the national health service they have to be asking men that they are admitting to hospitals now do you have a penis and i don't know why you are laughing pastor lady i'm telling man. you the gospel truth I'm not, I'm, I'm, i just said man <laughs> do you ah. have a penis and do you have a womb, something like that? Why? Because of this, I can fluidi fluidity of gender. Because mm. I can wake up this morning and be any gender that mm. I want. Mm. So as a result, where they would have put certain patients in certain rooms or certain wards, they ended up putting people that claim to have transited from one gender to another. That's the dangerous. Well, you think it's dangerous, but people say it's my right. They claim to be a female. You see? And as a result, the female that were in the wards were getting raped. Exactly what I want to say. You're going to be raping people. They you were see, getting... my, lust, my lust will make me to go and say now that I'm a female. So they can, I can camp in female camp and I'll be watching nudity, the nudity of people, the nude, uh, I'll be watching them. If you're nude, perverted, yes. That. If you've got a perverted mind, if you're sick. Have you seen any man that doesn't have a perverted mind? Well. <laughs> I'm here to see one. You, we, we undermine man. We undermine ourselves. We actually think that we are more than what we see. There is none of us. You see, man, man is a puppet. In the hand of two, two, in the hand of two forces, the forces of darkness or the forces of light, we actually think we are stronger than what we are. We are not the best of us. It will amaze us what the best man we see in the public, a champion, a man celebrated, what is falling for in the private, what is what is fighting with the lust, the greed, the the, the struggles here. Yeah, it will amaze us. You see, when we are all in shirt and like this, we we cover all we these look things. the same. We look the same, but it's not true. Man is man. Man is man. Man is not strong. Hence the reason why I believe David said, deliver me pr from presumptuous sins. Presumptuous sins, yes. I'm, exactly. I'm 19. Exactly. Deliver us. Uh, so <laughs> I pray, I mean, honestly, mom and dad, grandparents, aunties, and uncles, I'm appealing to you. I'm not demeaning your level of comprehension. But many of us truly don't know what it is that our children are encountering, they're struggling with, the challenges they're going through. Me and you, relativism is not a problem. Me and you, sexism is not a problem. Me, and, Do you get what I'm saying? But these children are in the thick of it. Yes, yes. Day yes. after day, they are. that's mm -hmm. why they come and they challenge you when you say mm -hmm. certain things. Mm -hmm. You know, you say there is a God. They said, but can there not be other gods? Mm -hmm. You said, oh, but Jesus, yeah, but couldn't Allah or Buddhists, couldn't they also? 
And to you, you'll be frustrated. You'll be like, but this is what they're exposed to. When they do religious studies in school, all religion, everything is on the table, is allowed, is acceptable. And, you know, depending on who is teaching it, they can advocate one over the other. Hence the reason I've always said to you, charity begins at home. Lay the right foundation from your home before your children go out. And I've cited many examples that my children have encountered in their RE classes in school. So please, I'm begging us. To us, this might not be this isms, isms. What am I doing with isms? Your children are dealing with isms. So please. And I've always said something. If it matters to my children, it matters to me. If it affects my children, it affects me. That's In fact, all of, all of us are dealing with isms every day, everybody. In different shades. In all different shades, yeah, which is why I gave you the way. example that I said that now they're not, uh, they're now asking, you know, so that they don't put you in a ward. And then when your urges take you, you end up going to abuse somebody that is already sick on a bed. And now you are <laughs> abusing them in the ward. I mean, that's the last place you expect to be sexually molested or abused. But that's where we have come to. Um, I, in one of the news I was hearing in Westminster in our very own parliament last week, the amount of uh, different gender or they, they tell me is, is, is different. So please forgive me if I'm not getting it correct. Whether it's uh, uh, um, the sex or gender, because they say there's a difference between the two. The amount of it, they said is over 100 now. Yes, yes, yes. Over so 100. Many. Mm -hmm. And apparently some people are deliberately for 20 minutes a day or something like that in parliament. They're going to go and learn and watch about all these things so that they don't offend anybody in the process of doing their job. Wow. Now that's the challenge man needs. We have created. See, the, the challenge, what I say about all this is that for us as Christians, I think this is powerful. The Bible says, darkness shall cover the earth and gross, gross darkness, darkness the people. It said, but arise and shine. And sh In the midst of this, this is what Christianity is. This thing should happen. It should. It has been happening in the days, in Sodom and Gomorrah, in the Roman time. In Roman time, it happened. It's just that social media and globalization is making things to be more apparent to us. Yeah. It has always been. But my own is that let's know that the kingdom we are, the light in our kingdom is superior. Mm. Let's raise our children to be, you see, the challenge, let's not be, let's not approach this thing from a weak point, from a mm. defensive point. Let's know that we have a superior thing working for us. And mm. we don't fight physical battle. We fight on our knees. We fight with the truth. We do our rugged work and let's get this. The power of God is here to back us up. Amen. Things will work. Even in Amen. the midst of this, our children will stand out as we pray for them, as Amen. we do everything. So that's why we are. I don't think that we should worry more about LGBTQ because there are other things that people do naturally too that is not apparent, but it's as injurious as that too. What about fornication? People are sleeping with themselves without having sex all over the place, you know, aborting and then doing all sorts. Not for me, these are all different shapes of sexual problems that and then different shades of sin all over the place. So for us as Christians, we are calling on God, evangelizing our world, trusting God for more wisdom, more power, because when darkness is here, this is time to shine as light. That's the way I see it. And then holding our truth, holding for the word of life in the midst of a crooked and perverse nations, is a in the in the midst of him who shine as light. So that's the way I see this thing. You see, uh, Pastor Lide, you can only shine the light that you have. So the problem is not the problem. It's not the problem. <laughs> the problem we are not knowing the truth. So let's it. To teach the truth. Let so the church is the one that had to wake up. They are exactly. You see, the unbelievers are waking up to do the negative. Mm. Let the believers to wake up to do the right. Let's not be defensive. Why must you say that somebody should not be LGBTQ if I want to be? Leave me alone with my life. 
You do your own and bring the superiority of your own and let people watch us, let people see into our lives and be compelled by superior power, wisdom and love to change. That's the way the kingdom of God thrives. Any other method, even if people don't do that, it doesn't mean they are okay. Societal wise, societal wise, okay, but for God, there's no difference as far as God is concerned. There's no difference. See, there's no you difference. used another language my truth that's something that i hear that is prevalent in the society again again <laughs> among the young people my truth what, what is your know? truth what what does he even know my truth what does okay. he know what does he know what is my they truth him, what they taught him two times two is four and you are saying it's for all the other players and he said your truth how how, you know when did it become his yeah how can you <laughs> analyze your truth that you it's for like you, you said you know, you said it at the beginning, whether we like it or not, what we claim to be ours was something we were shaped and formed yes, in ma us. It's yes, not, ma I can't prove mathematically, I can't prove to you that two plus two is four. I was taught, I embraced it, and I apply it. And yes. I've always used it like that. Yes. Now, if if I was to call a mathematician and say, how prove, they probably would be able to prove it. How you they can't come. prove it. Uh -huh. you, can prove it. you can only prove it in the context of what has what been you have been you. given to you exactly so you only be so plotting two plus two in the context of what has been given okay so <laughs> there is moment that again i'm appealing to each and every one of us i hope the meat on the table is not too tough for us i hope the meat on the table is not too hard to chew if we are look there's forum for I'm all for questions. I am always all for questions. I've always said one of the beauty of being a Christian is the ability and the freedom to ask questions. It is not a sin to ask questions. It is not a sin if we do not understand. In fact, the Bible even establishes for us in the book of Acts with the Ethiopian Enoch. I tell people, mm. you can be reading the Bible again and again. Look, one of the things I marvel about the Ethiopian Enoch, he went all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. But meanwhile, he did not have an understanding of the Bible he was reading. Can you, a religion, Kai. He did John not C. have he an did understanding, not. He did but not. yet he was doing something that mm. to me and you, ah, this man is Jim Jim. You know, can you imagine, you know, when I taught that a few years back, few years back, Pastor Lide, we tried to calculate if Auntie Cecilia is online, she's going to confirm what we're saying. We tried to confirm the distance between Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Wow. Without a flight. In those days. In those days. And the Bible said he had wow. a chariot because Philip had to run, uh, uh, he had to run the chariot. Hmm. So how, look at the distance of getting up in Ethiopia and going all the way to Jerusalem. How many wow. months is that? Wow, wow, wow. And yet wow. he did not have an understanding of what he was because even the place he was reading was about jesus he didn't know it was about jesus pastor Lide. Mm, it, it was the interpretation it was now so he went to worship somebody he didn't know yeah, he's there now <laughs> and that was what paul said to some people when he yeah. went to the in crete he said you guys you, you even worship the unknown the god, the god. god and that god i've come to explain to you now hallelujah so God please feel free i've said this i'm God going to say it mercy. again thank you auntie cecilia god bless you ma i'm going to say this again if you are any of the things that has been brought to the table if it's not clear pastor Lide is more than willing to help us to go through it to bring clarity because like i always say the teacher in me i can only run with what i understand i can only apply what I understand. If I don't have an understanding of something, I cannot utilize it. And if you're bringing this to the table for your children and they're coming up with more questions or bringing more things that you can't answer or handle, it's absolutely fine. It is not the end of the world. We reach out to one another, iron sharpen it another, we pull one another up, and that way we are not leaving every anybody behind, and we can all progress forward together in the mighty name of Jesus. Again, um, I think it's a good place uh, to. I'm. I'm not. 
Pastor Lady have done something today. He treated relativism. It wasn't on the uh, on the post. So the one that is coming on Friday is just okay. opposing isms. So <laughs> opposing ism. He suggested we put it so we know what we are going to see, and then he skip it's it because racism <laughs> racism is much. Okay. And I, know I won't finish it today. So, so I just want to push that to uh -huh. Friday. So you, that's what you're going to do for me. Before you give me mm -hmm. something that goes out, let us know whether it's something our one hour can cover or not mm -hmm. so that we'll be able to put exactly what people are expecting out okay. in the name of Jesus. So everybody, like I started saying, please do pray for us. Pray for all the men and women of God that comes to this platform. Pray for my boss and my household. I beg of you. We need, we covert your prayers. I beg of you. It, we, we, we Look, we are facing attacks on daily basis. It is part of the journey. And I'm saying, please uphold us in the place of prayer. We need your prayer. God answers prayer. And the prayer that you guys are, uh, you, you know, lifting up on our behalf will surely come to manifestation in our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. So everybody, as always, I'm saying thank you. And I'm sure Pastor Lady is also saying thank you. <laughs> so everybody, that's Pastor Lady. God bless you, sir, from Canada by the grace of God. And we're hoping to join him again on Friday in the mighty name of Jesus. So as always, uh, we are saying thank you. I'm saying thank you on behalf of everybody to Pastor Lady as well. We're saying thank you. God bless you. We appreciate you. And by God's grace, we are hoping to be with you if the Lord enables on Friday in the mighty name of Jesus. So until then, everybody, as always, I want to leave you in the only hands that I like to leave you in. And that's the hands of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have a wonderful day, morning, or night, wherever you are. Thank you. God bless you, and see you soon. Take care.